This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So let's go through and look at the impairment of assets. This sort of brings to a close a little bit everything that we've seen so far with regards to your, your non-current assets. So what we've got here, an impairment, I think we mentioned it briefly in the previous session, didn't we, with regards to intangibles, whereby if an intangible has a finite life, so there's no specific period of time over which we get the benefits for, it goes on forever and ever, then we need to subject the asset to an annual impairment review. And the annual impairment review is just to see if the asset has fallen in value. Okay, uh, And we have a specific standard that covers it. It's IS36. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run you through the three aspects that cover IAS36. Uh, so what we've got there uh, is it talks about identifying possible impairments. So this is nothing to do with the fact that there could be uh, some calculations to do. It's essentially saying, look, is there something that says, look, this asset might actually be worth less than what it is. OK, it's not saying it is worth less than what it is and has fallen in value. It's saying there is a possibility because of something that has happened. So what you have there is you have what are known as external factors and internal factors. So internal factors, something you can control that goes on within the business. External factors are something that's you know just, just gone wrong. Uh, in the economic environment that, that's out there okay uh, you then need to go through there if, if there is an external or internal indicator you then actually need to go through there and perform the impairment review so actually do the calculations to work out what the new value of the asset should be uh, then what you've got step three is essentially in step two you've got the numbers uh, and then here you know, you are essentially processing your journal entry, the, the, your, your favourite debits and credits. OK, so it's essentially saying, look, the value of an asset has fallen, credit the asset, debit, profit or loss. I'll, I'll give it away now. OK, uh, so let's go through them uh, bit by bit, chat our way through, work a couple of examples, see how you get on. Uh, so first one is to go through there and look at the indicators of the impairment. So remember. Uh, but this is just something that happens that says, look, your asset may have fallen in value. And I think, again, thinking about it from an exam perspective, uh, one, you will need to learn the indicators. And two, I think it's probably a good idea to identify what's an external and what's internal. OK. Uh, and essentially, the way I look at it is look at the, the external ones and then think, well, anything else is then internal. OK. Uh, so external ones uh, is there could be a significant decline in the assets market value uh, so that the value of the asset has fallen uh, whatever that reason may be i don't know uh, it could be maybe it'd be some shares that you have and the value has fallen uh, it could be an investment in debt that you have and the assets value has fallen uh, but it could just be a marketable property item of property plant and equipment uh, maybe land and buildings uh, and maybe there's been a, a fall in the market in terms of property so that is an external indicator, isn't it? There's nothing that you can do about it. It's something beyond your control. Uh, the other one is that you could have changes in the technological, economic or, or legal environment. I suppose the, the one that I would focus upon there is the technological environment. So you have an asset, maybe uh, an item of PPE. Uh, it produces some goods. Uh, those goods are technological goods and all of a sudden uh, so a newer, better technological product comes along. Boom, you know, that, that sort of renders your, your current assets, uh, as in the asset you're using, not as in a current asset by the standards. But your, your, your asset you are using is essentially worth a lot less now, isn't it? Because whatever goods it produces, nobody wants it because the goods are technically obsolete. OK, uh, so just bear that in mind there. Uh, other one, internal sources, uh, so obsolescence or physical damage. You know, someone's driven a forklift truck into your prized asset, uh, so that's internal, isn't it? Uh, changes in the way in which the asset is being used, so the asset has become idle. You're essentially no longer using the asset. If you're not using the asset, you're not generating any benefits, are we, from using it? And if we're not generating any benefit, then, then surely we should start to think about potentially reducing the value of that asset. Uh, evidence that the asset's economic performance will be worse than expected. So maybe its output has fallen because it is older. 
so again, that reduction in the output is something that's controlled internally. Maybe you've not updated the machine to, to keep it up with, to speed with advances in technology. Uh, but you know the, the reduction in the output, again, could lead to an impairment review. It's not saying the asset is going to fall in value. It's saying, look, we need to consider whether it has or it hasn't. Uh, if you're making operating losses in your business, then that could signify a reduction in the value of the asset and then the loss of a key employee. Again, the employee was internal. They've gone. I know they're now external. Well, that's an internal factor you could control. Incentivize them, remunerate them well, and they should stay. OK, uh, so commit them to memory, learn them. Uh, again, I, I think it could be a select all of the following. Uh, it could be a drag and drop type question. So I think there's good scope there for the examiner to go through and test you on those indicators. OK, the good thing is you're not going to have to memorize them to the extent of writing them out, are we? But I think a good way of remembering them is to actually write them out in your own time. OK, so there you go. I'll leave that up to you with how you want to go through and do it. OK, uh, so that's step one. Tick. So that's saying, look, your asset or group of assets may potentially be impaired okay uh second bit is actually doing the impairment review so that's actually working out the numbers okay again we have rules we need to learn the rules and not only learn them we then need to apply them don't we okay uh so what we've got there uh is the first bit it says if the carrying value of the asset so the carrying value being your cost less your accumulated depreciation or cost, less accumulated amortization. So this is going to apply not just to tangible, but also intangible non-current assets. Uh, if that is greater than the recoverable amount, uh, it is impaired. Okay. So, so what you've got essentially is if you write it out as such, if the carrying value is greater And the recoverable amount, then that asset is impaired. Okay. I hear you asking the question. Do not panic. Do not stress. Okay. What is the recoverable amount? I can hear you, you, you shouting at me to be down the computer. Okay. Uh, the recoverable amount, essentially, think of it as the best alternative way of dealing with the asset. Okay. The carrying value is what we get if we, we, we if that's the, the value of the asset currently, isn't it? But, you know, what you then do with the asset in the future, that there's two things that you could do, isn't there? You know, you could sell the asset. Yeah. Or you could carry on using it. And what we need to do is we need to look at the worth if we carry on using it and the worth if we sell it. OK, uh, so that's what the recoverable amount looks at. It looks at the greater of the fair value, less cost to sell and the value in use. So the fair value, less cost to sell is the amount we generate from selling it. The value in use is the amount we get from using it in the future. So, you know, what inflows net in cash flow, net cash inflow does it produce if we use it into the future? OK, well, we'll have to be specific over what time period. I think the standard specifically goes through and looks at a period of five years. But that, that, that's, I think, beyond the scope of what we have here. OK, uh, so again, it goes through there, gives you a bit more detail about fair value, less cost to sell. Uh, so fair value, less cost of sale is the amount receivable from the sale, uh, less the cost of disposal. OK, marketing costs, uh, any disposal costs that, that there may be. Uh, value in use, I think that could be examined. Present value of the future cash flows. So what net cash flows we should be specific do we get in the next five years and discount them back to present value. Sounds like a lot to consider. It is. But if you want the recoverable amount is the higher of you know you're probably thinking why the higher of well it's just economic sense isn't it you know if you get more money from selling the asset than using it sell it if you expect to get more money from using the asset than selling it then keep using it okay now, i don't think it's the lower because we're looking to reduce the value of the asset okay it's, it's about the economic reality here so the higher of the VIU, value in use, and fair value, less cost to sell. 
Okay, uh, there we go. If you remember that in the exam, you shouldn't go too far wrong. Okay, excellent. So let's go through, uh, play around with an example uh, of an impairment. And what we're going to go through and do here is this is looking at an example for an individual asset. So an item of PPE. Okay. Uh, so it says prepare extract from the financial statements for the year ended. Is it the 31st of December 20x9? Uh, so SFP, profit or loss. Uh, machine was acquired on the 1st of January X5. It's a long time ago, isn't it? Uh, cost of 50,000. Uh, use for life of 10 years. Okay. There we go. So we're going to depreciate it. Yeah, $5,000 per annum, isn't it? Uh, December X9. So that's the end of the year. Uh, so how many years have gone? X5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Five years, isn't it? So we are halfway through the asset's life. Uh, the fair value of the machine is 26 and selling costs are 2. Uh, the future cash flows are 5. And the current cost of capital, the discount rate is 10%. And taking pity on us, we don't need to work it out. 10% uh, five-year annuity factor is 3.791, which you apply to 5,000 cash flows. Okay, shall we have a go? Work it through, uh, see how we get on. Uh, so the carrying value, uh, we're halfway through, aren't we? So is that the as 25,000, isn't it? Uh, the fair value less cost to sell, where they fair value of 26, cost to sell of 2. Does that give me $24,000? Okay. Uh, the value in use is the 5,000 multiplied by 3.791. Tap that into your calculator, it gives you 8955. Okay. Uh, the higher of the value in use and the fair value less cost to sell, how much is it? Yes, it's there, isn't it? That's 24,000. Okay. Our carrying value is 25. So the fair value less cost to sell is 24, which is therefore the recoverable amount. Is that carrying value greater than the recoverable amount? I think the answer there is yes, isn't it? 25 is greater, isn't it, than 24. So we need to work out the impairment. Well, if the asset is currently worth 25,000, it is now worth 24 then the impairment is 1,000, isn't it? Okay. Uh, that didn't essentially answer the full question. You know, it wanted extracts, didn't it, from the financial statements. I do think that an objective test question would just ask you to work out the impairment. But and I do like to give you a, a fuller, better understanding of everything and how it works. So what you've got on the SFP, isn't it? And statement of profit or loss. Uh, on the SFP, your property, plant and equipment was that now there at 24,000. We've calculated the impairment which is 1,000, so that goes straight to profit or loss. Just be careful, uh, do be aware that the asset will have been depreciated in the year. It cost 50. Uh, it was depreciated over 10 years, we're halfway through. Uh, so that gave us the carrying value 25, didn't it? But the, the depreciation per annum is that 50 over 10, which is the five. Uh, if you're curious as to what happens then in the subsequent years, uh, you've got there, haven't you, now that 24,000. Uh, you now go through there, don't we? And take that adjusted value and depreciate it over the assets remaining economic life. So here 
is that five years. Okay, so 24,000 divided by five, whatever figure that gives you, uh, that gives you the figure there, doesn't it? Within next year's and then the subsequent year's statement of profit or loss. Okay. Excellent. As I said, uh, I think the, the examinability upon this question is going to focus more on working out that impairment of a thousand. Uh, and the way to work it through, isn't it, is to compare the carrying value versus the recoverable amount. Okay. Uh, the recoverable amount is the higher of the value in use and fair value, less cost to sell. Okay. Work through that example. I think you'll find some similar style examples in the revision kits as you work them through it. Okay, excellent. Uh, moving on, last little bit uh, is recording the impairment. Uh, we've already looked at the, the individual asset. So here we are looking at the debits and credits. Uh, the reduction of value is taken through profit or loss. Uh, just be careful uh, if it is revalued. If you revalued the asset, the gain has gone through other comprehensive income, hasn't it? Well, if that's the case, take any reduction in value to the revaluation surplus first. So remove all of any previous revaluations upwards that there may be. And then anything extra that you need to process goes further then into profit or loss. OK, so if I had gains stored up of 10 and I identified the impairment of 15, then 10 will go through OCI and the revaluation surplus, and then the extra five goes through profit or loss. Okay. Uh, the other bit that you've got, once the impairment has been accounted for, the recoverable amount is then depreciated over the remaining useful life. Boom. Uh, we did that, didn't we, by saying the 24,000 divided by the remaining five years. Okay. Uh, the other bit that we're going to go through and look at is referred to as a cash generating unit. Ugh, what's that about? Uh, well, for you and I, it's looking at the value of an entire business, not not just the value of a, a a little item of property, plant and equipment. Because when we go through and think about uh, the recoverable amount, uh, we can work out the carrying value of a business, looking at all the value of the assets, uh, the value in use. You know, we can go through there and look at the, the, the economic benefits that we get from carrying that business on, can't we? Uh, and look at the cost of running it, looking at the income we generate and discount it back to present value. What about the fair value, less cost to sell? It's going to be a little bit tricky, isn't it? You know, but if you're looking at individual assets, you, know, you might have, imagine you're a restaurant, okay? You have a chain of restaurants. You can work out the carrying value of each of the restaurants. You can work out the value in use of each of those restaurants because you know how much revenue you generate, you know, the cost that you incur. But, you know, this horrible, is it, fair value, less uh, cost to sell? OK, uh, you know, if you're looking at it from an individual asset perspective, that's going to cause you problems, isn't it? OK, from, a, from, a, from an overall business perspective, you can look at what the value of the business is worth in total and, and look at the cost of selling it. But you can't look at the, the value in use and fair value, less cost to sell and carrying value of each individual asset. Because, you know, go, go into a restaurant. You know, have, have, next time you're in a restaurant, have a look at the restaurants. You know, what do you see? You see tables, you see chairs. OK, you see ovens okay you see plates table chairs uh cutlery cups glasses okay there might be a bar okay uh, there'll be toilets okay what's the fair value of each of those little items you know what's the fair value of, of a particular set of tables and chairs okay what, what's the value in use of that particular set of tables and chairs okay you might be able to establish a fair value but what about the value in use um, what do you get from using that table and those chairs and what do you get from using the oven OK, what about all the, the crockery, the cutlery, the pots and the pans, the value and use of the toilets? Crackers, isn't it? You know, that's just not possible. So what we do is we look at the cash generating unit. If you like, by definition, uh, it is, and we've written it, the, the smallest group of assets that cash flows can be allocated to. OK, so you can take a restaurant or you can take a business uh, and you can allocate the cash flows to that if you like overall business so you can work out the value in use and you can work out the fair value less cost to sell okay so it's that value in use those cash flows that you get from using the assets if it's difficult to work it out for an individual asset then group them all together okay the issue that you have there is that when you're looking at the, the overall so we say the restaurant or the overall business you can work out the carrying value you can work out the value in use you can work out the fair value less cost to sell what happens if you then have an impairment? 
how do we then allocate the impairments? You know, what, what assets do we record the impairment against first? Well, we have some specific rules. Again, could be a drag and drop type situation in terms of numbering it one, two and three. Uh, but what you do there, first of all, is you look at any specific assets that are impaired. So that will be told to you within the question. Uh, you then impair any goodwill that you have within the business. And then you look at any remaining assets that are left. So whatever is left of the impairment, then you allocate it on a pro rata basis, okay? Uh, based upon the, the carrying values. A uh, tiny little bit there, you know, we, we are using the cash generating unit to, to impair then the individual assets, aren't we? By the specific assets, the goodwill and anything else. Uh, just no, no single asset in the cash generating unit should be reduced below its recoverable amount. So if you know what you can sell it for, uh, then do not reduce it below that value. OK, essentially it's saying, look, even though the value of the business is impaired, this specific asset is not impaired. OK, uh, so I think this would be one of the, the more technically difficult challenges that you get within the exam. So fix our head. Let's get thinking. Uh, and it says, demonstrate how the impairment will be accounted for in the financial statements. Uh, so it says there, Siobhan fully owns a company called Harry. Uh, so I'm assuming there that, that Harry is the business, which is our cash generating unit. OK. Uh, extract from Siobhan, statement of financial position relating to Harry. So relating to our CGU. So the smallest group of identifiable assets that generate the cash flows. We have some assets there, goodwill, franchise costs, uh, restored furniture, buildings and other net assets. OK. Uh, key bit, it tells us that the restored furniture has an estimated realizable value of 150 million. OK, so that's what it is worth. Uh, the franchise agreement contains a sellback clause, which allows Harry to cease using the franchise and receive a $30 million payment from the franchiser. So that's, you know, we've franchised the business out. Uh, it's got a value in our, if you like, financial statements, because that's what we paid. But if it's not going well, then we can sell it back. OK, cease the business. And that's, if you like, what we would sell it back for. OK. Uh, an impairment review at the 31st of March, X5, estimated the value of Harry as a going concern is $250 million compared to Harry's value is it there of 370 so it looks doesn't it like Harry has been impaired okay uh, so what we can go through and do there isn't it let's have a play around with the numbers so the way in which I would do it is I would list out what's going on within the cash generating unit so we've got the goodwill We have the franchise. We have the furniture. We have the buildings. And other. OK, uh, the values that we have before any impairment. So before. Are 90,000. 50,000, is it another 90, or is it 100, and was it 50,000? Totaling that up, does that give me, is it 370? So all I've done is just copy the figures across, nothing spectacular there. I then need to look at a column which calculates the impairment before I then go through there and look at the value of this cash generating unit after, which should, is it be 250,000, okay? So I think the impairment that we have, the difference between the two is 120, isn't it? So that, that's the impairment of the cash generating unit. But how do we then go through and allocate it? Uh, well, what you've got there is I think the first thing to identify is that the furniture is not impaired, is it? Uh, because it said, didn't it? And I quote, 
the restored furniture has an estimated realizable value of 115 million. Now, don't start increasing it to 115 million. All that is doing is saying it is not impaired. Okay, so there's no impairment of that asset. We were told something about the franchise, weren't we? So that's a specific asset over which we're told it could be sold back at 30,000, isn't it? So does that go through there and give me an impairment of 20? So of that 120, 20 has been used up. Okay. We then go through and allocate it to goodwill. Okay. Because as we'll see in our group accounts chapter later, goodwill is just a made up number. Okay. So it's made up. Let's get rid of it. Okay. There's no way that we can play around with that. It just goes. Okay. If there's not 90,000 still to impair, then just impair whatever you need. Okay. So if there's 70 left, impair 70. And we'll be left with 20 of goodwill. Okay. Uh, key bit is we've impaired, what is it, 90 and 20, 90 and 20, 110, isn't it? So that's 110,000 that we have impaired. How much is left? Yeah, excellent, 10. So 10,000 is left, isn't it? And that will be allocated to the other assets on a pro rata basis. Blech. Why didn't we pick some better numbers? We've got 10,000. And we're going to allocate it, is it, to the 50 and the 100. So to work it out pro rata, we'll take 100 out of the total. Is it 150? We will take 50 of the total. Is it of 150, isn't it? Again, we apply that to the 10,000, which is the, the, the impairment that is left. Christopher, what were you doing? Maybe I was thinking you're never always going to get round numbers in the exam. Isn't that horrible? Yeah, there we go. Uh, but what you've got there, uh, the value of the buildings, I think, comes down. Is it to nine, three, 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 three? Let's just remove that bracket there. And then the other is four, six, 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 seven. Okay. There we go. Uh, how would that be examined as an exam question? Uh, I think maybe you might be just asked what is the, the value of, say, the buildings or the value of the other after the impairment has been calculated. OK, uh, and then to do that, you need to go through the various steps one, two or three. Now, it could be nice and generous and say, well, look, uh, what's the impairment on the franchise? That might be more straightforward. Or maybe if there wasn't a uh, hundred and twenty thousand impairments. Uh, and, you know, we hit impaired all of the goodwill. Maybe we will be asked what is the, the value of goodwill after the impairment because it hasn't been fully impaired. OK, so just bits and pieces to go through there and think your way through. OK, excellent. Uh, where does the impairment expense go? None of the assets appear to have been revalued, so it all goes through profit or loss. I think that would just make it a bit too complicated if these assets had been revalued. But if they were, remember, we impair the asset through OCI first and then anything that's left goes through profit or loss, doesn't it? OK, so there's quite a little bit to consider there, isn't there, with regards to impairments. So take a little bit of time away from me. Uh, I make sure that you fully understand everything we've done so far on your assets or the non-current assets that we've seen, both PPE, intangibles and impairments. And then once you've done that, come back and then start looking at some of the later chapters. OK, good luck.